JTech Studios in Atlanta, Georgia. It's America's favorite game show podcast. Tell them what they've won. And now, here are your hosts, Tom Bastak and Mike Jacobs. Welcome back, friends. Episode number 15 of America's Favorite Game Show Podcast. Tell them what they've won. I am one of the game show guys, Tom Bastic. And I am the other one of the game show guys, Mike Jacobs. Thanks for coming back. Got a great new episode for you this week. You know, are are we technically the only two game show guys, Mike? Or can we call Christian a game show guy? Maybe. I mean, he's getting he's getting close. I'll say that. He's got to earn his his way. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, exactly. You don't just become a game show guy. Yeah, you, you know? I mean, yeah. You, yeah. I mean, okay, well, you you and I were born game show guys. Yeah. Well, of course. For we, us, we I mean, invented it was the natural. Term. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I love it. <laughs> All right. So we made it to episode 15. Um, by the way, we we I'll throw it out there for the first time, but we're really not going to start pushing and promoting until about probably episode 17 or 18. Got a really big episode coming for you on our 20th. The 20th, really big episode. I'm excited. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to be doing everything that is big. Big, big, big. You got to say it three times. That that emphasizes the bigness. <laughs> it's big, big, big. Big, big, big. <laughs> All right. Uh, hey, let's uh, do some bit. We do have a bit of news. I mean, business before we get to the news. Yes. Uh, and then we'll do news with Christian and we'll move on from there. Yeah. You want to start with the first one? Sure. Um, I don't know the story as well as you do, um, because you were the one that actually took the the comment on Facebook. But we had a gentleman by the name of Bob L. from Pennsylvania who wrote in a really, really cool uh, comment when, when we were talking about Joker's Wild. A gentleman by the name of Boeing Kerens, the statistical consultant on the show. And he presents the mathematics of game shows often at conferences. Bob went and heard him speak a few years ago and showed uh, the, the, you know, they were showing like all the, the bits and pieces of it. And he went back and watched tons and tons of episodes from the 70s in order to figure out how to recreate the distributions of the actual amounts that come up in the slides of uh, joker's wild uh-huh, uh-huh. so uh they he basically watched a bunch of episodes he kept track of the results he recreated distributions of the old slide projectors and then multiplied them by 10 so basically it is what it is um later he visited the set saw that there was a 300 dollars space on the reels but the producers because the producers felt that a 250 dollars space was a bit too cheap bowen then mentioned to the producers that well, if you're going after the values, you might as well just add a 420 space, <laughs> which of course is you know nationally known for 420 for smoke and pop, blah blah blah, which Snoop right. obviously does of a course, lot of, of course. And in quotations, and that's how we got a weed joke on national television. <laughs> what a great story! And what I mean, yeah, that's awesome. Bob, thanks for sharing that with us. I think that's that's awesome, and um, I hope I did it justice. Uh, if you want to read more about that, or you'd like to contact Bob and chat with him about it, uh, he did uh, leave a comment on our Joker's Wild page on Facebook. So check it out. Uh, yeah, and then from our, uh, I guess, not corrections, but omissions department, uh, Brian okay. L. mentioned that uh, we totally whiffed on the bonus squares in Scrabble. And I had notes about this and was ready to talk about it and everything. I think I just totally skipped over it and didn't make it on the show at all. So we do apologize for that. But there were bonus yeah. squares in, in the Scrabble game show, much like they are in the uh, board I game. Don't, I don't know how we missed that because that was in our cue sheet to talk about. I know. I'm saying. I, we, I uh. think we just both brain farted and skipped over the line. I mean, okay, we are normal human beings, ladies and gentlemen. Please. <laughs> I love you. And, oh, by the way, uh, incidentally, I just want to throw it out there. Um, I forget who it was that was was saying something. But uh, every week I push out for our teaser. Um, we try not to give out what show it is that we're going. We just throw a, a hint out there. And I throw a hint out each and every week. And they are a little, I don't know, what's the word that you use? Esoteric, I think. Es- I, you know, I want to say that's a good word. I also want to say it's kind of like, you need some sort of deductive reasoning to, to, sure. to get to it. Sure. You know it's, what I'm saying? Yeah, it's like, not a straight, linear thing. A, a perfect, for instance, is I put X's and O's with a little arrow, like heart graphic up there, which, yep. of course, everybody knows is hugs and kisses. So 
I mean, obviously, and, and someone may see that and go, oh, well, it's a guess that, you know, could be love connection maybe. Yeah. Well, and I think I said this in the Facebook thread that I knew what show it was, and that one still took me a second to be like, what? What? I don't understand, so, but I fi- well, obviously it was, figured it out. But yeah, it's X's and O's for tic tac toe. You yep. know what I'm saying? Yep, yep. But the thing is, is that what I encourage you guys to do is listen to the trailer, because in the trailer we essentially told you it was one of three things: it was hopscotch, connect four, or tic tac toe that we were referring to. True. And if you see that, and then you see XO, you can draw the line from tic tac toe and X and O. Yeah. Pretty but- closely. And then your guesses are narrowed down to what tic tac toe and 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 Hollywood Squares, right? Yeah. I mean, so so it it it's a two part thing. You, you you need to listen to the trailer and then the hint that will be in the graphic that accompanies it. But that's some fun that you guys can have. And eventually, uh, once we get down the road, I'd love to actually uh, throw out some prizes for um, for guessing that early. Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah, so we'll uh, we'll talk more about that. Speaking of talking, let's stop talking right now and bring in uh, the gentleman who will one day be a game show guy. Yay, it's time for the news. Light up your cigarette, crack open a beer, put the kiddos to bed. From chaos around the world to carnage in your very old front yard, it's time for the news. Thank you very much. This is the news brought to you by buzzerblog.com. After only one airing, Taskmaster in the United States is no more. The show, co-hosted by comedian Greg Davies and comedian-slash-creator Alex Horn, was canceled after it premiered to a 0.1 rating and a meager 212,000 viewers total. The CW picked up reruns of the original UK series in the midst of a drought in original programming, but sources are now saying the network is re-evaluating its options, including the possibility of moving the show to CW Seed, its streaming platform. And for what it's worth, Taskmaster did win a BAFTA award last week, considered one of the highest honors in the world of British entertainment. So if you're looking for a puzzle, there it is. Yeah, it's a bit of a bummer that they would cancel it after just one episode, even if the ratings were low. Dude, it's the CW. They don't have great ratings on anything. Right? They could have done such a better job of promoting it, though, because I feel like they picked a season where a lot of the celebrities that were participating weren't really well known in America. Meanwhile, you have other series where there are contestants that have stand-up specials on Netflix. You could have cross-promoted that. They could have done just a better job overall of making people aware of this show. But Yeah, for sure. Unfortunate. Well, yeah. I mean, maybe it goes to Netflix or something like that. I mean, you know, Lord knows this would be a great way to watch it. Oh, that'd be great. And in the meantime, the show is uploading episodes on its official YouTube channel, and that's viewable worldwide. So you're not at a loss if you're a fan of the show nice. uh, and living in America. Nice. Great. Well, I highly recommend watching it. I mean, I've seen the first two thirds of the of one episode. I can't wait to sit and watch more. I've just got to make room in my uh, in my viewing times. All right, Kristen, what else you got for us? Well, a second Game Show Network original production will be jumping to syndication this fall. The Joey Fatone-hosted quiz show Common Knowledge is coming to several Fox television group stations. The four-week trial run begins on August 3rd. Markets airing the test run include New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, Phoenix, Tampa, Minneapolis, Orlando, and Austin. Uh, Each episode of Common Knowledge sees two teams of three answer multiple choice questions covering practical, everyday things that, in theory, everyone should already know. Uh, The first Game Show Network original production to go into syndication was called America Says. That ran through the end of this past TV season and earned relatively high ratings, but it was not renewed for a second off-network season. This is one of those shows that Game Show Network has gotten really good at making lately, where it's really simple, takes place in a studio, um, and it's watchable, but you could also sort of tune it out. Like, it's good background sound. So I, I wonder if people won't uh, really like this kind of show. But, I mean, we'll see. In all fairness, I've been tuning out Joey Fatone for years, so this is just going to go right <laughs> on with it. Uh, good guy, though. <laughs> all right. Oh. <laughs> Thanks for saving us there, <laughs> Christian. I appreciate oh my that. God, of course. All right, what else you got? Well, the American adaptation of The Cube now has a host. Former Miami Heat star Dwayne Wade has been announced as the host and an executive producer of the American version of the hit British game show. Warner Media is handling the show and has not yet decided which of its many properties, TBS, TNT, True TV, streaming platforms, the show will air on, but we do have uh, word that it is debuting next year, 2021. Uh, and we previously broke news of the show casting contestants for its American 
debut in early July. Now, it's a sort of stunt show similar to Minute to Win It, but with uh, much more theatrics. Um, it's a really suspenseful and fun show. Uh, one of the differences in the American adaptation, they're introducing a new helping hand component, which allows Dwayne Wade to enter the cube to compete for the contestants. All right, so I I just got to say this. I mean, I don't. I'm sick. I'm not sick of basketball guys feeling like they have to be involved with game shows. I mean, we've got, um, you know, uh, LeBron James is producing uh, stuff, and then now we've got Stephon Curry, sorry, uh, who is doing Holy Moly. But like, the the now Dwayne Wade is not only producing, but he's going to host it. Right? Yeah. I I don't know. I, I like. I'm all about diversifying, and and you know finding new ways to uh, explore your interests and all that. Uh, and, it, you know, him being a uh, producer is fine and all, but just putting him in the host seat seems a little uh, strange. I don't know. Like, what qualification does he have? I don't know. I mean, at the same time, I think about Snoop, and he was a terrible host his first season of Joker's Wild, and by the second season, he was amazing. True, true. Well, here's the one thing I do like, though. Mike, and I don't know how many episodes you've seen of this, but I've watched a few, and the having his agility in the cube as like a as like a lifeline that's cool oh yeah for sure i could see how it would be an asset to have him on your side during the game um you know having him help with maybe agility or hand eye coordination those sorts of things well and then sometimes it's like as easy it's as easy as like counting um boxes on the floor and if you just had a second person in there where you say hey you count this side i'll count that side that just helps having a second person in the cube Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. Cool. All right. Uh, Christian, we have got This Week in Game Show History up next. Yes. Well, This Week in Game Show History, we're going back to 1973 and the premiere of one of my favorite shows, The New Treasure Hunt. Now, this was a revival of a show in the 50s that was created by a uh, comedian named Jan Murray, and he hosted the original one in the 50s as well. And the original and the revival, the new one in the 70s, had the same basic format. There are 30 big wrapped gift boxes on stage. All of them contain prizes, whether they're really good prizes, fur coats, cars, trips, or terrible prizes. And one box in particular has a check for $25,000. And Whoa. the format is super simple. You pick a box and you win what's inside. Now, there was always a sort of buyout before they opened the box. They'd give you some money to uh, sell the box back. And that's a sort of mechanic that we see now in shows like Deal or No Deal. This is one of the originators of that. You know, do you want to open the box or take the money and run? Uh, and it was a really entertaining show. You know, there were skits to accompany each of the prizes in the other boxes. So uh, as a result, there were 29 different skits prepared for each uh, taping session. And really? it was incredible the amount of work that went into this. And because of security, because it was a live check on stage, and because they didn't want to ruin the surprise for the contestants, who were always women, by the way, there was never a male contestant on Treasure Hunt ever. Because wow. they're more, they had just had more emotion, I guess, which is sort of problematic thinking now, but back then it's just what flew. Um, you know, for those reasons, there were no cue cards allowed on set. So the host, uh, Jeff Edwards, by the way, which is this was his second national game show. Um, the host, Host had to mentally prepare for 29 different skits every show. So they picked the box, they'd go to commercial, so a producer would come out and brief him on what the skit's going to be. And the show lasted uh, in the 70s for about four or five years. Um, and I think its height in popularity was when 60 Minutes did an expose on the show and whether game shows were going too far in uh, heightening the suspense. You know, Jeff Edwards was a master of heightening the suspense for every prize, and there was one instance when a woman fainted on set after being shown a Rolls Royce or a uh, Cadillac or something. And the producer, Chuck Barris, who went on to host the gong show, created the dating game, Newlywood Game, he was really proud of the fact that he had a contestant faint on the show. So, again, 60 Minutes of this whole thing about whether game shows are exploiting uh, human emotion, whether they're going too far. Um, so the show never really got more popular than that moment. But in terms of game shows, I mean, it's just one of the coolest. I highly recommend anyone listening watch it there are tons of episodes on youtube as well so what's funny is you brought up uh deal or no deal and of course there's very obvious parallels there but really what this made me think of was uh i don't know if you've ever seen the weird owl movie uhf 
I have not. Been years and years. Oh man, it's it's a classic. I I highly recommend it. The plot is he takes over a TV station, so it's of course just Weird Al parodying TV. Uh, but he comes up with this game show called Wheel of Fish, and the general concept is you spin a giant wheel. Whatever fish it lands on, you can win the fish. But then he will offer you to take what's inside the box, and uh, of course the joke in the movie is that there's nothing inside the box. It's a great, great movie. I, I really recommend seeing it. I love it. Well, I'll tell you how the original 70s version got canceled. They were preparing for a new season, and the producer pulled the host aside and sort of explained that he had these plans for even more sadistic prizes. So the idea that sort of pushed the host over the edge and made him quit the show, he was going to roll out a, a car, a Rolls Royce or a Cadillac or a convertible. And once the excitement died down, he was going to tell the contestant that she only won the windshield. Wow. And the host. Wow. Yeah. And Jeff Edwards was like, I'm not doing that and left. And instead of finding a new host, they just canceled the show. So just to clarify, the producer that you're talking about here is Chuck Barris, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that dude's just an out and out madman. Dude, I, I, yeah, I'm not a big fan of his. And, and I'm also not surprised that he's proud that people are passing out on his show. Yeah, I mean, I don't. I honestly don't know much about him outside of that movie, uh, Confessions of a Dangerous Mind, and I honestly don't know how accurate that is either to his book or what actually happened. But it's pretty clear that he's obviously a, at least a very difficult person to work with, uh, if if not just like I said, not not madman. I did an interview with a game show host named Jim McCrell, who did a show called Celebrity Sweepstakes in the 70s. But he did a show for Chuck Barris back in the 60s when he first started. And he worked with him for a few years. And, you know, the original host of the gong show was a guy named John Barber, who went on to be on a show called, like, Real People, some sort of, like, human interest series. Uh, And they didn't like him as a host, the network, and they suggested that Chuck Barris host it. So instead of firing him like a normal person would, this is according to... Uh, Jim McCrell, the guy I interviewed, uh, Chuck Barris called him and said, congratulations, you've had the misfortune of being hired by a producer who's a better host than you are. Yikes. Wow. Okay, that's a dick move. Right? right? Jesus. This week, Christian, we're doing Hollywood Squares. Yeah, I grew up with Hollywood Squares in a different sort of context because I grew up with the 90s, 2000s version hosted by Tom Bergeron, which was on mm-hmm. for, you know, a few years. Uh, so that was always a show that was in my sort of line of vision for a long time. And I, I was really entertained by it, I think, before I even knew what was going on. You know, I, I wasn't I wasn't old enough to understand a lot of the jokes. But as far as a game show, I mean, it's it's... I know that there were previous versions of the show that I wasn't really familiar with until I got a lot older, but uh, I always thought Hollywood Squares was really entertaining. Actually, one of my first exposures to Hollywood Squares was the home version for the Nintendo Entertainment System. I had the really, version. yeah, and it was honestly plays true to the original show. All the questions, all the writing comes from the original writers on the uh, John Davidson version from the 80s. And if you want a chiptune version of the original 1980s theme song, that's where to get it. Because the soundtrack for that game is so cool. Highly recommend it. It's always like five bucks at the used game stores and stuff. Nice. We may have to put that up on the uh, website with the YouTube video of the theme from the NES game. Yes, do it. All right, great. Uh, Let's see. We got a plug for Buzzer Blog this week. Of course. Buzzerblog.com, the number one game show website in the world, whether you're looking for information on casting, new series, returning series, series that got canceled, series that got canceled despite winning the highest award in British entertainment a week prior. (laughs) Buzzerblog.com. You you sound a little salty there, brother. (laughs) Nah, uh, you know, I'm fine. I'm fine. You know, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. I want a BAFTA. I mean, you know, it's fine. Thank it's you fine. so much, Christian. We appreciate it. No problem. My pleasure, as always. All right, Mike. We're doing Hollywood Squares this weekend. Now, you know this has been one of my favorites, and I watched uh, the John Davidson versions and the Tim, the uh, Tom Bergeron versions as well. Did you watch this at all as a kid growing up? Uh, yeah, just kind of in the background, it would kind of happen right. while I was like in the room. Right, it something that you tuned in Yeah, for I didn't seek it out, for sure. Um, and I think we, we're, we're going to be kind of at loggerheads with this one, because, man, I do not like this show. 
it's That's really fun. it's really all the the same issues I took with uh, with Match Game, but we'll we'll get into all that. Uh, a little yeah, later ab- but. absolutely and and by the way i i have no problem i hate double dare it, it's probably the worst <laughs> show on television yeah sure so okay um <laughs> i see you're just you're just getting personal with it now hey i i'm gonna take it personal when you don't rate this the best the best game show ever. now and by the way you will see from my ratings as we go i will not rate this as my highest game show even though it was one of my favorites growing up well it's not without its faults i'll say that that's cool. All right. Uh, coming up in just a little bit, we're going to do gameplay. We'll take a quick break and be right back. You've been listening to America's Favorite Game Show Podcast. Tell them what they've won. Hey, gang, it's Mike and Tom from America's Favorite Game Show Podcast. Tell them what they've won. And we want to talk to you a little bit today about how we got started with Anchor.fm. Yeah, you know, it's interesting with so many podcasts out there, it's not as easy to get started as you might think. And it was a pretty daunting task at first, but during my research, I came across Anchor.fm, and boy, I tell you, it seems like the perfect solution for getting started. You said it best, Mike. They had a way to grow the podcast. We had the opportunity to put our podcast out there on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and all the platforms, and then make money from the beginning with minimum listenership, and then grow. Yeah, exactly. It's the perfect platform to get everything done. They've got all the tools to edit and publish and all that kind of stuff right there, straight from your phone even. If you don't even have a computer, you can do it. And we can start small, and we'll have features to help us every step of the way. If you're looking to get things started on your own podcast, just download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get things started. That music there means it's time for Hollywood Square. Hollywood Square. Welcome back to America's Favorite Game Show Podcast. Tell them what they won. So, Hollywood Squares, the gameplay here, much like with Match Game, I'm going to draw a lot of parallels there. There's not really a whole lot of gameplay to talk about. Now, again, with as with Match <laughs> Game, I'm going to try and be uh, as neutral as possible. And we're well, just. Well, I mean. Yeah, here's the thing. You're just describing the game. The game has no gameplay. It's not your fault. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm glad you. I'm glad you're at least on board with that concept. So, oh, it, this. Although this is one of my favorites, I I agree with you. Like now, the funny thing is, you'd think I would like match game more. But I, I really don't. Now, this, on the other hand, I like a lot more. But anyway, we'll get into that. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, so you have con- two. Hmm. So you have two contestants here. One uh, typically is male and the other is typically female. And also one is typically a returning champion. Uh, One of them will represent the X and the other will represent the O. And they are basically just playing a game of tic-tac-toe. The board that they are placing their X's and O's on is a 9 by 9 grid of celebrities sitting in these little booths. And basically each contestant will take a turn selecting a square. And then that celebrity is asked a question. Um, Usually it's just very simple trivia. Um, And then they will, uh, I guess for an example, um, the one that uh, stuck in my head because I knew the answer right away, it was uh, what president uh, campaigned under the slogan, uh, a chicken in every pot and a car in every garage. Uh, mm. do, do you happen to know this one? Uh, Truman? No. Uh, that, I think that was multiple choice, and that was one of the guesses. It was Hoover. Uh, okay. Yeah, Hoover, oh, okay. Hoover. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Promising, of course, uh, the idea of um, financial independence for every home in America, uh, which didn't actually turn out too well, <laughs> but there you go. So, so it, 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 and, that, and, that's, and that's funny because, like, honestly, the – you know the chicken. It was saying what you were. It was saying that basically a chicken in every pot was like wealthy families would, would could have a chicken in every pot. Yeah, exactly. Well, and then at the time there was a joke. Uh, it, well, and Christian uh, later informed me that this was applied to many other things, but the only one that I was uh, familiar with is uh, people, uh, specifically poor people in the South, would refer to turtles as uh, Hoover chickens because it was meant to be the chicken in every pot that they were getting but since they were poor they had to eat turtles that's so funny because like just the other day you know i was telling somebody i was polish and they said oh well then you must know uh about uh city chicken and i was was like like a pigeon or something 
Yeah, that's exactly what I thought. I was like, I was like, I've never heard of city chicken, but to me that would seem like okay. You live in the city, you can't afford a chicken because you're not on a farm, so it must be a pigeon then, right? Right, exactly my thought. So that's that's not at all. Apparently, and and by the way, I've never heard of this. This is very big in the Detroit, Pittsburgh, Cleveland areas, which are typically very Polish, very um, uh, what is it? Uh, not Lithuanian. What's some of the other countries? Uh, um, uh, anyway. Uh, those those areas and those folks would uh, and when they said it was a Polish dish, I was thinking, oh great, so this is like a big Polish joke, like city chicken, <laughs> uh-huh. you know. But it, that isn't the case. Apparently, chicken in, during the Depression, and I guess this goes back to the Hoover chicken days as well. Right, uh, couldn't afford the people who lived in the cities were poor and could not afford to put a chicken and have Sunday chicken dinner, which was like a big big deal. So instead, they had pork or veal. Which was much cheaper to come by, which is funny because veal right now is like right? super expensive. Yeah, it's about as pricey as you can get. Right. So they would take pork or veal, they would then bread it, and then they would par or deep fry it, and then bake it for sixty to ninety minutes. Which, by the way, I was let's just talk just about dry that. Dry the crap out of it. Oh my god! Well, which it was served with a gravy. I come to find out afterwards, and I wonder why. Oh well, there you Dude, go. Dude, all you have to do with veal is literally par fry it, and it's not right. <laughs> Anyhow, it's called City Chicken, and uh, that's because they couldn't afford it. So this was like their chicken dinner was pork or veal, and it was deep fried. I would have been like, take that veal and that pork, and let's get it out of the breading crumbs. Let's get it out of the deep fryer. Let's go put it on the grill. Let's baste it a little bit. If you want to take that gravy, we'll add a little water to it and make a, some sort of a marinade out of it, and then we're going to serve it, and it's going to be fantastic. Uh, true, but you also have to remember this is the Great Depression, so... This is very true. <laughs> well, I mean, the times were different back then, is what I'm trying to say. Times were different back then. All right. Well, anyway, sorry to get off on the chicken yeah. thing, but but I, I just it's so funny how that all came up, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. So uh, back to the show. Um, the the celebrity has asked the question, much like you know this whole Hoover thing that got us off target. Uh, right. And they will give. <laughs> uh, they always come back with their little zinger, quick, funny answer, um, and then followed by their actual answer. And their answer may or may not be correct. But the idea is that they are trying to make the contestant think that they are giving the correct answer. And then the contestant either agrees or disagrees with the answer that the celebrity has given. So what this is to me, and again, Go ahead. I'm, I'm trying to be impartial, but Go ahead. Um, the contestant doesn't do really anything. anything. Doesn't they have to have any knowledge. Doesn't have to have any knowledge. Doesn't have to have any personality. Doesn't have to have any humor. Just agree or disagree. It's not even right. it's not even knowing the answer. I mean, I guess if you know the answer, then it makes it easier for you to agree or disagree. But well, it's just and, and so in that regard, it's very much like match game where the, they just have to right. like think like they just have to match like they're not even really right. Like, the it, first thing that comes to their and, mind. And that's ultimately my sort of issue with this show is that it's I like games and gameplay and the intricate rules and how to work within those rules to get the best possible results and those sort of things. And there is none of that in this show. Okay, it's so just wacky jokes and I'm gonna, Buddy I'm Hackett gonna, I'm, acting like a baby for an hour. Okay, well, okay. So Buddy Hackett was one of the celebrities. We'll talk more about all the celebrities that were on there in in all the versions that were were mm-hmm. out. But he was one of the big ones back in the in the first version of this. But I will say this: there is a little bit of gaming that has to go on because I saw it in the episodes that I watched last night. And depending on where you where do you start. And who do you pick? And Square. well, that's how you would play a normal game of Hollywood Squares. And I watched every single episode. I watched nobody picked the center square first. And and I found it interesting because like they there's there's like if you pick the bottom left, let's say, okay, mm-hmm. and you get it right, and then they decide, well, I'm going to pick the middle, and they get it wrong. You now have those two, and you're already playing for a win. So the point is, if you pick the middle and get it wrong, you're already going to have to block the next time it comes back to you if the other person gets it right. That so there sense. is a certain amount of gaming that comes into this. But so, it's no more complicated than just the strategy of, I guess, you're playing tic-tac-toe, you don't run the risk of giving the other person the square. 
That's the whole point. The point is, if you answer correctly, you get to put the X wherever you want in that square that you choose. If you answer incorrectly, they're getting the uh, they're getting that square automatically. That's true. That's true. So there is some sort of gaming in that regard, but there is. You're right. There is no gaming in terms of trivia, which I know you're a huge quizzer. You're a huge trivia guy. For sure. There's none of that in this game, and I therefore understand why you're a little let down because you're like, gosh, it would be really nice if I could get you know, some questions asked of me, which they yes. would occasionally ask of you if the, the celebrity didn't know. Yeah, there there were uh, occasions where they didn't have an answer and did, could not come up with a bluff, uh, and it was just given back to the contestant to answer. I think Christian touched on this, uh, but I guess they, like, almost nobody ever actually did that. Yeah, because um, why would you? Because if you, unless you knew the answer. Right. Unless you knew it was Hoover, uh, was it Hoover? Yeah. Uh, unless, unless you knew it was Hoover. You wouldn't you wouldn't take that question. Right, right, right. Cuz you don't want to run the risk of giving the other person the square. Right. Well, the the other thing is is there is some sort of a strategy too and do you let the do you purposely pick the wrong answer and let this person take the square so that you have the opportunity to do something else? Like if you want that secret square because if you guess the secret square, how much money do you get? Uh, I mean, it depends on the version you're on, but yeah, you could potentially keep playing for the secret secret square i don't know that i've ever seen anybody do that it seemed no risky, it was, it was but... in one of the episodes that i watched last night the guy had the opportunity to pick a different square that could have been the secret square or go for the win and actually just went for the win yeah i mean it's it's you probably win more by winning than you do by getting the secret square so well i think because if you win if you win like because this is best of three games or whatever and you have the chance to go on to uh the bonus round which is the car thing and that was only in the in the Davidson version, but it was like a one in five chance to win a car too. So, uh, well, so one thing I did think was interesting is that they eventually, not eventually, pretty soon after it started, had to uh, introduce a rule where um, you could win by getting fi- any five squares because it is theoretically possible to get up to six squares and still lose the game. Like you can get six squares and there's still a you know three in a row available for the other person to get. So they they cut it at five. If you got five squares, then that was considered sufficient enough to win the game. Interesting. I'd have to play tic tac toe to see that in person to understand, but I know what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. And that's it on gameplay. <laughs> yeah. For sure. Um Yeah. I mean the, the well, I guess the only thing we didn't mention uh, was that uh, if handing over the square to your opponent, as in you didn't get the the agree or disagree correct, uh, if that would cause them to win by default, it was not awarded. And instead, they just switch control, and the other opponent would go instead of just winning the game from someone. Right? Else they couldn't. Win, they couldn't win on somebody else's loss. Essentially, exactly. is what you're saying. Exactly. You had right. to earn the square to win. Now we're going to talk more about this in the next one, but I know that you have written here. Zingers were sadly pre-written. It, yeah. And so let's chat about that real quick. We've got some time here. Okay. Um, the from what I understand, and we talked to Christian a little bit about this off air, that they were everything. Everything wasn't given to the to the the celebrities. They weren't given the questions. Right. So they just had like a list of jokes and a list of answers and they had to like, once the question came up, they would figure out, oh, that's what this joke was about and and say it or whatever. So that, so if they couldn't come up with a bluff, they couldn't, uh, they would have a joke probably that would fit. But if they, even if they didn't have a joke, because not everybody gave a joke, by the way. Right. If you, if you watch the old ones, not everybody had a quick zinger to, to give, but. No, that's true. Um, but if you if you couldn't come up with an answer, or they they looked at their list of answers and they didn't know which one it was, and they couldn't figure out a bluff, the celebrity could actually just not answer if they were taking too long, whatever. Right. And the host could therefore just throw out the question and give it get another one. Uh, well, no, that's we talked about that. That's when the they would go to the contestant to right, get and them and the, the contestant didn't want it, then right. they would yeah, throw yeah, it yeah, out. Yeah. That's what I mean. Yeah, you're yeah. right. Gotcha. Um, but but. Crazily enough, that stuff's all written, so it is possible that that could happen, but it didn't happen often. Right. Well, but that's the, I think that was part of the the disillusionment for me on this show was the having those jokes pre written because, like I said, if you're not gonna have a strong gameplay element, then you really got to go strong with the celebrity zingers. And if the it's pre written, it just feels like it feels very disingenuous to me. So. You don't know that, though, until 20 years later when we're talking about the show. I understand that, for sure. 
but and and I have to tell you, like you you're, you're saying that you have to be either heavy on gameplay or heavy on entertainment or like heavy on the show part, right? And I'm not so saying it's this not was heavy. heavy on the show part. I'm not saying it's not, and and I don't the the pre written thing is not like the end all be all like oh it's no. pre written I'm done with it. I'm just saying no, no, no. the the if you're not if you're gonna have a show like this where it's supposed to be highlighting the celebrities, then highlight the celebrities. Don't give them pre written stuff for them to throw out. Oh, see now I disagree because like if you told all the stand-up comedians that are out there they're not allowed to rewrite to pre-write their jokes, they have to all just do it improv off the top of their head, they're gonna suck. That's a totally, totally different topic. I though. I see, I don't think so. I think that this is part of the element of the show. It's like a sitcom or, is not necessarily improvised. It is written and therefore it is presented. That's all they're doing. They're acting up there. They're either bluffing and they're acting, or they're reading jokes and they're acting. They're acting up there, which is what a celebrity is good at doing. Yes, but it's not like when you watch a sitcom, you know everybody's acting. You know that Jerry Seinfeld isn't actually Jerry Seinfeld. And until on Seinfeld. you found out the behind the scenes, you didn't know that they weren't doing it off the top of their head, off the off the cuff. But it doesn't matter if you know or not. The fact is, like the I am in theory laughing at a comedian who is not delivering their own material but under the guise of delivering their own material. That happens all the time. If you look at the Jerry Seinfelds of the world and all these other guys, they all have writers that help them write jokes. I'm not saying they don't. And again, like you're putting way too much emphasis on my consideration of this. I'm just saying, why not have the celebrities write their own zingers? Why, why in a show where you're supposed to be highlighting the celebrities and having fun with them and showing what they can do to make a fun, entertaining show. Why not let them do that instead? I could go on this show and do exactly the same as Buddy Hackett or Zsa Zsa Gabor or any of them. Right. But here's the thing. Some of them did actually, and more of the recent episodes, I've read about some of these guys who were on there who were who did write their own singers, who did come off the cup with it. They didn't have to use what was given to them if they had something they thought was funny. But the point was is they wanted a whole bunch of celebrities on here, and most of most celebrities, as you well know, are not funny. Yeah. So you better write it in so that you have uh, everybody getting a good laugh, so that the the thing is fun and that people tune in and watch. I don't I don't think it's that big of a deal to have them have written in now i like your idea though but i also think you're going to cut down on how many people actually want to do the show if they know they have to come up with something funny off the cuff right yeah you're not wrong about that for sure i mean i think i think i think it would be great i would absolutely love it way more i think i would give everybody a a ton more credit who's a celebrity who goes on a show where none of this is written it's all being made up on the spot i mean i would love to see hollywood squares done with all the guys from whose line is it anyway sure because then you know you're getting real stuff made up right away Right. And and I think that's my point is you can either do that or you could write a actual game so that it's compelling to watch. I feel like this is a disingenuous way of making the show compelling. I, I think the show is still compelling. Fair enough. And the ratings will prove that too. That, that again, like I said with match game, I realize I am wrong. Like <laughs> you're not there, wrong. There, there, not there wrong. is, there is empirical <laughs> evidence saying that my opinion is wrong, and I am, I am fully willing to admit that. <laughs> First of all, it's your opinion. It's impossible for it to be wrong because it's your opinion. Second of all, it's, it's not that you're wrong. It's just your opinion is not common. Right. That is yes. the thing. Yes. And by true. the way, that's okay. As a matter of fact, I love you because your opinions are not common. Oh, hey, thanks, brother. And there it is. All right, when we get back, we're going to talk history. uh, And then at the end of that, you're going to love it because we're going to rate this thing. Oh, we'll rate it all right. (laughs) Well, I guess you have to give a rating in order for it to be a rating. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I I don't know if I've said this before on air, but I am uh, making a personal statement that Uh, I don't want to give a zero to anything. I think one indicates unpleasant to watch, uh, and I'm definitely not giving this a one. I'll tell you that right now. But, uh, yeah, I'm I'm never going to go zero. I'll say that. History, when we come back, you've been listening to America's favorite game show podcast. Tell them what they've won. Welcome back. It's the Game Show, guys, on episode number 15, segment number three. This week, Mike? Hollywood Squares. 
your favorite game show. Yeah, that's that's uh, no, but I, I was waiting for Christian to tell us that he had some sort of personal attachment to this one. <laughs> well, he does seem to do that a lot, doesn't he? <laughs> All right, it's time for the history of the game. Let's talk a little bit about that. Sure thing. We go all the way back initially to 1965. That's when the pilot aired uh, for this, but it didn't actually get picked up and debuted on television until October 17th, 1966, with, of course, the legendary Peter Marshall as the host. Yeah, and, and, you know, he almost didn't take the job. You know that, right? Yeah, as I understand, there's some amount of spite involved in his taking of the job. Well, the one story that I heard, and I'll let you talk about spite, Bite, but the one story that I heard was that he had a girlfriend in New York and he had just gotten done with something on Broadway and he had an opportunity to go back and do something else there. And he happened to be out in L.A. and they gave him the opportunity to audition. And he was like, man, I'm not sure I want to do a game show. Uh, well, it's only a 13 week commitment, so I guess I'll go audition. But then you found this. Well, yeah, there was also uh, a comedian by the name of Dan Rowan up for the job, and apparently there was a very large feud between the two of them. They did not get along well, uh, despite uh, Marshall being, um, I guess, sort of uh, integral to Dan Rowan getting his career started. But yeah, apparently Peter Marshall really did not like Dan. They had some personal issues and... uh, so, yeah, when, when he found out that Dan Rowan was his, uh, I guess, competition for the show, he decided to take it, like I say, at least a little bit to spite Dan so that he wouldn't be the host. That's great. Yeah. I, I, I love when there's like, I'm doing this so you don't get the chance. Well, and what's interesting is it ended up being so successful, you know, uh, it's interesting to think of what his response to that was, because like you said, he kind of wanted to stay in New York and live out his life there. And if he thought this was just going to be a temporary gig and it turns into you know what 10 13 years something like that yeah uh, man that that's amazing i mean the original one was what 10 10 years as well uh, more than it that it was uh it uh let's see here what 66 to 80 so yeah that's, I mean, that's four, thir- 13 and change yeah yeah, that's 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 a long time. Uh, and like we say, it was incredibly successful, specifically for the first 10 years. Uh, it was just at the top of the ratings all the time. It had a great time slot and it did very, very well there uh, until, unfortunately, a rather common story that we see. They start shuffling around time slots and now all of a sudden the ratings hurt. And this is a thing. It's so interesting. You see, we've talked about it on the show many times. It's happened. It happens with sitcoms and all sorts of shows. Where the network executives get this idea that they need to swap things around for some reason and then end up tanking the show. And maybe it's on purpose. Maybe it's not. Who knows? But if it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, you know? Yeah. It's 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 just too bad because I, I believe that you're right. A lot of shows lose out because of being swapped time slots. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, in, in addition to the, the normal run, there was also uh, a nighttime syndicated version of the show, which ran... Uh, I don't remember the exact years, but intermittently throughout those uh, 13 and change years. And then uh, there was also a uh, spinoff for children. Uh, It started in the late 60s and then ran again in the mid 70s. So there were two runs of this, actually. It was called Storybook Squares. Uh, I didn't didn't find any episodes to see how similar it was, but... uh the, the only thing I read about it was that um, Peter Marshall loved it. He thought it was great. But the problem was is that all the actors would dress up as storybook characters. And they would spend so much time on introducing each actor, or each character, I should say, that they really didn't have a lot of time for gameplay. So he kind of he didn't like that. But he loved the idea of it. Um, speaking of which, who was... I mean, I, you know, I think that this is something we talked about a little bit in the gameplay. The center square is probably mm-hmm. the most popular because obviously that's the first square that you ask. Right. Uh, so they're going to get asked, they're going to get utilized or asked in every single game that's played. So the center square is kind of your feature square. Who was the feature square during Pete Marshall? Uh, so I believe that was mostly Paul Lind. Um, yeah. I, I don't know that, I mean, obviously with the strategy of tic-tac-toe, the center square is integral to the game, but I don't know if they, like from the beginning of the show, had the concept of the center square celebrity as our like, big returning every time person. Um, but mm-hmm. for that run, yeah, Paul Lind is is most commonly in that center square, uh, which, you know, I think they tried to get the 
uh, maybe wittiest and uh, most charismatic people in those squares. Uh, so they're like you say, they're always going to get picked on and not picked on, but chosen. Uh, and you want to make sure that they're going to have a good zinger or, you know, have a thoughtful well, answer and be able to entertain because they're the one who's going to be on the show the most, presumably. And, and the funny thing is, you know, we talked about how they were, you know, a lot of the jokes and whatnot were written for these guys. They used to serve up Paul Lynn with like big old softball questions that he would just like have the best zingers. And of course, if he's the center square, he's got to have the best. Zingers. Exactly. Exactly. But I love all the writing. The writing of those jokes is amazing. If you ever get a chance, a Google, um, and maybe I'll even throw the website up on the Facebook, but uh, on the Facebook page, uh, I will tell you that there is some great, great jokes that are still standing up today that were written back in those days. So God I, bless the writers. Absolutely, there are some really, really good zingers in there, and no, no doubt that. Uh, I, d I don't want the the impre my impression of the show to be that it was poorly written. I just didn't like the concept that it was written. They did a very mm. good job with writing it. I won't deny that. Yeah, I, I, I have to tell you, it's like you could tell these guys could have been writing sitcoms. That's how, how good these jokes were. For certain. For certain. Um, Incidentally, you want, a you want a funny story? I'll just throw it out real quick. Yeah. Uh, at, at one point, <laughs> actor Jack Palance... Uh, and you remember Jack, you one arm pu sure. push up guy, right? He uh, was caught I, that's napping. Not how I remember him, but sure. <laughs> oh, you know what I'm saying. He was caught napping uh, in his square once and had to be woken up by Michael Landon, who was in the square next to him wow. when the contestant called on him. <laughs> uh, uh, sorry, go back real quick. What did you say when I uh, you asked if I knew who Jack Balance was? Oh, he was Mr. One Arm Push Up Guy. You know that? No, that's Jack Lalane. No. Jack Palance at the Academy Awards when he was like 95 years of age, got down after winning his award, and did one-arm push-ups. What? I'll let you Google it later, brother. I'll Maybe we'll throw that. that link up on the Facebook page, Please too. Please do. I want to see that. Um, incidentally, you know who else appeared on the uh, first version of this show? Who's that? Big Bird. Oh, like the, the puppet? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Do you Just know like it... Alf, was, Alf was in the later versions. Right. Yeah, I, I knew that just because I'm a huge Alf fan, and uh, right. I, I got two trivia questions for you right off the spot, real quick. Okay, go ahead. Can you tell me? Can you tell me who is inside Big Bird, and can you tell me who is inside and voicing Alf without looking it up? No, I can't. I can't tell you either yeah, one of those. Okay. I have zero idea. Uh, Big Bird is uh, Carol Spinney, uh, which is a man, despite being named Carol. That's fine. And uh, okay. Alf is uh, Paul Fusco is his name. Interesting. Yep. Interesting. Well, the funny thing is, I don't know if you remember Big Bird, but when he was on Sesame Street, he always called Mr. Hooper, Mr. Looper. He always got the name wrong. I didn't and know that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, funny enough, when he was on the show, instead of calling Peter Marshall, Mr. Marshall, he would call him Mr. Marshmallow. <laughs> <laughs> I like so, that. Uh, Funny so the other thing I didn't know and Christian said this is that apparently Alf hosted an episode and I did not know that. Yeah, I want to find that one. Yeah, I'm gonna have to look for that. Anyway, so that that's uh, some quick stories. Continue onward. Uh, well, that's uh, so all of these stories are in this uh, you know just immensely popular version that ran uh, like we said 13 ep or 13 years. Uh, it ended up with I wrote this down because it seems like an astronomical number uh, 3,536 episodes. That's a heck wow. of a lot of episodes for a show. Uh, June twentieth, nineteen eighty, yeah, is. is when when it ran out, uh, as it were. Um, now I don't know if that count actually includes that nighttime show, and I assume it does not include the spinoff storybook squares. But still, a lot of episodes. Um, then we later in uh, eighty three and eighty four, we come back with the Match Game Hollywood Squares Hour. Uh, which is exactly as it is on the tin. Um, you know, a double billing of those two shows back to back. Uh, right. This, interestingly enough, has never been rerun. Uh, the online platform Buzzer, not to be confused with Buzzer Blog, uh, they have purchased the rights to it and say they're going to be rerunning it, but have not actually done so yet. So as of right now, Match Game Hollywood Square's Hour never been rerun. And interestingly enough, Christian also brought up to us off air that that was the only... Um the only version of Hollywood squares that was not scripted. And there was not a lot of zingers because of that, that the um, actual, there was not, oh, no bluffing involved by the celebrities. It was literally the celebrities having to try to answer the questions if they knew the answer. And then basically the, the contestants would say whether or not they believed them. 
Interesting. That sounds, despite my not liking that it's written, that sounds even more boring than a written version. <laughs> that sounds terribly boring yeah. to me. I mean, just I all the things you're taking all the th- all the show elements out of the show. Yeah, no, for sure, for sure. Now you have no, you have now you have no gameplay and no show. Agreed, agreed. Ah, uh. so yeah, obviously that did not last for very long. One year less, even. Uh, but then we fast forward a couple years to 1986, September 15th. We see the new Hollywood Squares, hosted by John Davidson. Uh, as far as the center square for this one, I it seems like they didn't keep any one person for very long. It I'd only caught maybe two or three episodes on YouTube, but they all had someone different. Uh, the very first episode seemed noteworthy because Bronson Pinchot, Balky Bartakovus <laughs> from Perfect Strangers, uh, he was the center square. So I have to that- imagine that maybe this reboot didn't have the high quality of celebrity guests if... Bronson Pinchot is making it to the center square. It it's interesting because John Davidson got the gig, got the nod for the gig, but he was a uh, contestant quite a bit on the old Peter Marshall show. Right. So it was That's like true. a natural transition for him to move up into the hosting gig. And this is the show that I started watching. This is when uh, it was just to me it was it was super fun. It only lasted uh, a couple of years, but I really enjoyed watching it. They had uh, the car uh, where you had a choice of one of five cars, and if the car mm-hmm. started, you won it kind of thing as the bonus round. Mm-hmm. Um, and I I was, I was watched it every night. I mean, I really did. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, that one ran for three seasons, a little more popular than the, the Match Game Hollywood Squares hour, uh, but ended in 89. Uh, and then we have the one that Christian spoke of, which – you know, I knew about the older show, but this was the first one I actually, I guess, watched knowingly and intentionally. Uh, but starting right. in September of 1998, we had a revival hosted by Tom Bergeron, of course. Um, and you have for this one, Whoopi Goldberg as the center square. She was also a producer on the show. Um, and uh, the I don't know, it's it's tough. This is definitely a generational thing. But I feel like the celebrities on this one were maybe the highest caliber of all the iterations of the show. I understand that I don't know celebrities from the 60s and 70s, so maybe that's part of the reasoning. Um, but yeah, there were a lot of lot of big name celebrities at the time on this version of the show. Well, and I yeah, I think I think you just probably understood a lot more of who these people were exactly. than you did some of the I had older folks. Way more cultural fine. context for them for sure. I want to I want to bring up a really cool thing um and it's out there online and we'll have to find it and I'll try to jump it on the on the Facebook page as well. But there is a clip that's often played about a prank that's played on Davidson for a April Fool's joke. Oh, I think I saw this, but I didn't know it was a prank. I thought it was real. Yeah, during a normal round, a female contestant angrily argues with the male contestant looking over David's podium at his answer cards. As John increasingly gets a kind of quote unquote deer in the headlight headlights look, the female contestant gets up from the chair and confronts the male contestant, finally pushing him over the edge of the raised platform. Unknown to the stunned Davidson, both contestants were actually stunt people. Wow. Oh, now, so check this out. It gets better. So repeated and as they would say, cranked up to 11, <laughs> uh, which is the. Which is the trope for what what they call for like taking something to the next level. I mean, if you go to TVTropes.com, there it's all there. Well, it's thanks to Spinal Tap. Well, exactly. That's where that comes from, though. Right. Um, but Tom Bergeron is taping a show in 2003 for April Fool's Day. And at one point, the male and female contestants are engaged in a heated argument, after which the male contestant makes the female contestant break down and cry. Wow. Ber- Bergeron's even more deer in the headlights. Uh, he can conf- comforts her and then sends the show to commercial. Meanwhile, the camera's running for the whole thing. Henry Winkler, who's the producer of the episode and also filling in as the announcer at the time, announces over the intercom, uh, hey, Tom, April Fool's. <laughs> wow. So good. Yeah. So I, well, good. I, I, on a personal level, I hate it. April Fool's Day. I hate pranks. I hate practical jokes. I, they're not funny to me. Uh, mm-hmm. So that doesn't tickle my funny bone. But that being said, in on in the like planning and execution, those are very good ideas for pranks. Yeah, and I think I think they're done innocently enough in this regard that it's it's kind of fun. I yeah, don't. I'm not hurt. a. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of these prankster shows and all this other stuff. That right. to me is that's not. That's like. F- 
foo on you, ha ha. And I, I just, I'm not a big fan of that stuff. I definitely get it. I agree. Uh, you brought up Henry Winkler, and I, I wanted to mention him as well. Uh, oh, something, okay. Something that I thought was a neat little uh, through line that I was able to draw in that 98 revival with Tom Bergeron. Uh, at various stages during that show, it involved Henry Winkler, Jeffrey Tambor, and Martin Mull. Uh, all three of whom were on the TV show Arrested Development together, which is actually fairly around the same time. This uh, version of Hollywood Squares ended in uh, 2004, I believe, and uh, Arrested mm-hmm. Development started in 2003, so there was definitely overlap. So I I have to think that there's some manner of connection with those three being on both shows, you know, like they knew each other or something like that. Oh, I'm sure they all hung out or whatever. Yeah, yeah I mean, Martin Mull ended up taking over when when Whoopi uh, left the the program as the center square. Martin ended up in the center square for a while. I right. think he was actually on the very last episode. I think he was the center square. Yeah, um, and, and he Tambor did a great was job. A announcer for a while. Yeah, they're so so good. Uh, loved love all of them. God bless. That's yeah, great. Absolutely. Well, I just wanted to bring it up because I absolutely love Arrested Development. So anytime I get a chance to mm. talk about that show, I will. Yeah. Hey, one other cool thing. Uh, I just wanted to bring this up because I saw this this note and they did something special that involved the the st- at home audience uh, a little bit more where viewers could win prizes during uh, this is during the H2. So this would be the new Hollywood Square. So this is not Tom's uh, the Tom Bergeron. This is, version. This is no, this is the John Davidson. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes. John Davidson in 86. Yeah. The new Hollywood Squares. Right. Gotcha. Right. This is the new Hollywood Squares. They had a week called It Just Ain't Right Week. And basically during the week, and I, you know, it's so funny because I remember game shows doing all these gimmicky weeks. Like Hollywood uh-huh. Squares broadcasted one whole week from Hollywood, Florida. Um, Wheel uh. of Fortune would do like Wheel of Fortune in Radio City Music Hall. Like yep. they would just. They would take things on the road or they would do something different to, 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 to change it up. So they did It Just Ain't Right Week, and viewers could win prizes on how many deliberate mistakes they would spot. Things like uh, contestants swapping portions out to I Love Hollywood is the theme, the theme song for the show. Um, you know, that, that sort of thing. Interesting. And so the That's people a- at home are just trying to spot what's different about the show and yeah and i don't know i i'd have to go down the rabbit hole to figure out exactly how they were to enter if i had to guess fill out a postcode self-addressed stamped envelope too you know yeah for sure well and what's i i wonder uh is that really a gimmick or is that them trying to make an actual game out of this thing uh michael (laughs) all right i guess you got anything else for history before we rate no that's all i got like i said uh was it 2004 was the end of uh hollywood squares all right. Well, uh, there was uh, Nashville, the Nashville version. I don't know if you know about that. I don't. Uh, yeah. So there was a, a country western version that came out in like 2017. It was it was brought up, and then in 2019 it actually debuted. Um, and the host was Bob Saget. Ooh. On and a country uh, show. interesting. All, yeah, all country all country musicians in the in the squares. Is this on what like CTM or something? Yeah, CMT gotcha. or something. I don't know. Yeah. CMT. Yeah. So uh, anyway, that that's the most recent that we've seen. I don't know how ABC hasn't jumped on bringing this back with all the other crap they've brought. Yeah, I mean, I, obviously, like I said earlier, the the popularity of the show speaks for itself. So I'm clearly in the minority with my opinion, but uh, I, I got to imagine it's going to come back at some point. Well, let's uh, do our ratings. I guess what what are you doing uh, out of how many the squares? Right. What else you got? Yeah. How many squares? I think squares is right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll go first. I'm going to give this one four solid squares. Four. And um, yeah, no, and you'd see four even seems a little high to me. I'm going to say 3.75 squares. And here's the reason why I loved the show part of this game show. To me, it was entertaining even when I was young. And I got to tell you, when I was watching the version that was out um, with John Davidson, which was. 1986 to 1989 i was young i was 12 to 15 years old i was i was Mm. young and Mm. i still got the jokes and i watched it every night with my mom and dad and i still laughed and i loved it and the cool thing was is that as you've said you didn't have to be really smart to agree or disagree with the celebrity so even as a 12 year old i could go agree sure x gets the square you know so it was approachable for me 
it is nostalgia back from when I was back to where I was uh, at those times. And I felt like the show part of it, the jokes were all great. And I did know those celebrities, you know, watching Alf or watching, you know, whoever. Right. Well, that's squares. the later ones for sure. But True. yeah. Yeah. True. But but OK, so I and I watched the, the Tom Bergeron one almost every episode of those, too. So so watching all those people, I knew all those celebrities. I loved seeing those celebrities outside of their shows on something else. Yeah. So uh, three point seven five for me. I, I don't I really want to go four, but I'm going to be because of the lack of gameplay, which you have very clearly and I admit <laughs> is absolutely true. There is no game here. Uh, I'm definitely going to go back to 3.75 for that yeah uh so i'm i'm on the opposite end of the spectrum obviously as we've mentioned uh i guess i'm gonna go with a two i think um i don't remember what i gave match game but i would give this a quarter of a point lower than match game that, i uh, think that sounds right i think you get 2.25 for match game so two yeah that's yeah cool. something like that um and i mean it makes sense that they pa- they paired the two together because they're two shows that's just Hey, watch celebrities be wacky for a little bit. And again, when I'm looking for these, I'm looking for fun games. I love the gameplay. You know me; I'm a huge gamer. Uh, that's 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 what I want to see: the intricacies of the rules and all that kind of stuff. And there's none of that here. Uh, the old version, I think I'm too young for because I don't know anybody. I just missed the ones in the 80s, apparently, and then the 90s. It was like I'm older and too cool for school and didn't care about it. So there's no right. nostalgia for me. There's no like, you know, like I like I mentioned before with American Gladiators. There's no uh, grilled cheese tomato soup sh- show for this or for me on this one at all. So yeah, sure, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. going to. It's just not for me. All right, that's not a big deal, but that is all the time we have for today. Yes, indeed. Thank you again to Christian for joining us with the news and all the folks at Buzzer Blog for uh, pairing up with us. And, of course, all of you who uh, take the time to listen and write in. Again, we love hearing what we've missed, what we've done wrong. Please let us know. <laughs> Especially the done wrong stuff. <laughs> yeah, well, or just flat out missed like boneheads. Yeah, well, and that happens, too. Tune in again <laughs> next time when we bring you the latest and greatest in the world of game shows as well as a brand new featured show, too. And remember, you can always catch us online. I'm going to say these in a different order this time. Let's go Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Tell them what they've won.com. Wow. Com. How you are stepping out of your comfort zone, brother. Right? I read the script backwards. <laughs> <laughs> Please, okay, I'm going to do the same thing. Please drop a review, like, share, or subscribe if you like what you heard. And if you didn't like it, well, I don't like Hollywood Squares, so I suppose everyone is entitled to a bad opinion. All right, Mike. I'll see you next week. Bye, Tom. You've been listening to America's favorite game show podcast. Tell them what they've won. A JTAC audio production. Copyright 2020. No part of this podcast may be reproduced by anyone without the express written consent of the creators. For more information or to contact us, please go to tellthemwhatthey'vewon.com. All right, Mike, what did you learn this week? Uh, maybe this is, I have to imagine, at least partially a generational thing, but Buddy Hackett is annoying and not funny, and I don't get his appeal at all. He's just wacky looking, and I don't, ugh, I don't like that. I don't like Buddy Hackett. I honestly, I don't, I don't have anything against Buddy Hackett. I don't have anything for Buddy Hackett, but I think it's a generational thing more than anything. It's got to be. So for me, I think I'm figuring out what I like about game shows, Mike. And this is very apropos for us because you like the game. And I like the show. Right? And that, I think that I don't even know that we had planned this to be the sort of take on the show when we first started. But no, I love no. that we've sort of settled into that role where, like, I'm the game side, you're the show side. And we, yeah. we, and, we and make a good pair I that would, way. It would have never come to me until we've done enough of these that it's actually what I'm figuring out. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose the uh, alternate way of phrasing that is you have bad taste in game shows. Oh. oh. Copyright 2020, a JTAC audio production. <laughs>